Readings from the Liturgical Year by Dom Prosper Guéranger January 20th St. Fabian, Pope and Martyr and St. Sebastian, Martyr Two great martyrs divide between them the honors of this 20th day of January. One a pontiff of the Church of Rome, the other a member of that mother church. Fabian received the crown of martyrdom in the year 250 under the persecution of Decius. The persecution of Diocletian crowned Sebastian in the year 288. We will consider the merits of these two champions of Christ separately. St. Fabian St. Fabian, like St. Clement and St. Dantheros, two of his predecessors, was extremely zealous in seeing that the acts of the martyrs were carefully drawn up. This zeal was no doubt exercised by the clergy in the case of our holy pontiff himself, and his sufferings and martyrdom were carefully registered. But all these interesting particulars have been lost in common with an immense number of other precious acts, which were condemned to the flames by the imperial edicts during the persecution under Diocletian. Nothing is now known of the life of St. Fabian save a few of his actions as pope, but we may have some idea of his virtues by the praise given to him by St. Cyprian, who in a letter written to St. Cornelius, the immediate successor of St. Fabian, calls him an incomparable man. The Bishop of Carthage extols the purity and holiness of life of the Holy Pontiff, who so peaceably governed the Church amidst all the storms which then assailed her. There is an interesting circumstance related of him by Eusebius. After the death of St. Antheros, the people and clergy of Rome assembled together for the election of the new pontiff. Heaven marked out the successor of St. Peter. A dove was seen to rest on the venerable head of Fabian, and he was unanimously chosen. This reminds us of the event in our Lord's life, which we celebrated a few days back, when standing in the river Jordan, the dove came down from heaven and showed him to the people as the Son of God. Fabian was the depository of the power of regeneration, which Jesus, by his baptism, gave to the element of water. He zealously propagated the faith of his divine master, and among the bishops he consecrated for diverse places, one or more were sent by him to these western parts of Europe. We give at once the short account of the Acts of St. Fabian, as recorded in the liturgy. Fabian, a Roman by birth, governed the church from the reign of Maximian to that of Decius. He divided the city into seven parts, which he consigned to as many deacons, and to them he gave the charge of looking after the poor. He created also a like number of subdeacons, who were to collect the Acts of the Martyrs written by seven notaries. It was he who decreed that every year on the fifth feria of our Lord's Supper the chrism should be renewed and the old should be burnt. At length on the 13th of the Calends of February, January 20th, he was crowned with martyrdom in the persecution of Decius and was buried in the cemetery of Calixtus on the Appian Way by reigning fifteen years and four days. He, was, he held five ordinations in the month of December, in which ordinations he made two and twenty priests, seven deacons, and eleven bishops for diverse places. Thus didst thou live out the long, tempestuous days of thy pontificate, Fabian. But thou hadst the presentiment of the peaceful future reserved by God for his church, and thou didst zealously labor to hand down to the coming generations the great examples of the martyrs. The flames have robbed us of a great portion of the treasures thou preparedst for us, and have deprived us of knowing the Fabian who so loved the martyrs and died one himself. But of thee, blessed pontiff, we know enough to make us thank God for having set thee over his church in those hard times, and keep this day as a feast and celebration of thy glorious triumph. The dove which marked thee out as the one chosen by heaven showed thee to men as the visible Christ on earth. It told thee that thou wert destined for a heavy responsibility and martyrdom. It was a warning to the church that she should recognize and hear thee as her guide and teacher. Honored thus with a resemblance to Jesus in the mystery of his epiphany, pray to him for us, that he mercifully manifest himself to our mind and heart. Obtain of him for us that docility 
to his grace, that loving submissiveness to his every will, that detachment from all created things, which were the support of thy life during those fifteen years of thy ever-threatened and anxious pontificate. When the angry persecution at length broke on thee, it found thee prepared, and martyrdom carried thee to the bosom of thy God, who had already welcomed so many of thy martyred children. We too are looking for that last wave which is to break over us and carry us from the shore of this present life to eternity. O oh, pray for us, that it may find us ready. If the love of the divine babe, our Jesus, be within us, if, like thee, we imitate the simplicity of the dove, we shall not be lost. Here are our hearts. We wish for nothing but God. Help us by thy prayers. St. Sebastian At the head of her list of heroes, after the two glorious apostles Peter and Paul, who form her chief glory, Rome puts her two most valiant martyrs, Lawrence and Sebastian, and her two most illustrious virgins, Cecilia and Agnes. Of these four, two are given us by the calendar of Christmas tide as attendants in the court of the infant Jesus at Bethlehem. Lawrence and Cecilia will come to us further on in our year, when other mysteries will be filling our hearts in the liturgy. But Christmas calls forth Sebastian and Agnes. Today it is the brave soldier of the Praetorian band, Sebastian, who stands by the crib of our Emmanuel. Tomorrow we shall see Agnes, gentle as a lamb, yet fearless as a lion, inviting us to love the sweet babe, whom she chose for her one only spouse. The chivalrous spirit of St. Sebastian reminds us of the great archdeacon, both of whom, one in the sanctuary and the other in the world, defied the tortures of death. Burnt on one side, Lawrence bids the tyrant roast the other. Sebastian, pierced with arrows, waits till the gaping wounds are closed, and then runs to his persecutor Diocletian, asking for a second martyrdom. But we must forget Lawrence today to think of Sebastian. We must picture to ourselves a young soldier who tears himself away from all the ties of his home at Milan because the persecution there was too tame, whereas at Bourne it was raging in wild fierceness. He trembles with anxiety at the thought that perhaps some of the Christians in the capital may be losing courage. He has been told that at times some of the emperor's soldiers, who are soldiers also of Christ, have gained admission into the prisons and have roused up the sinking courage of the confessors. He is resolved to go on the like mission, and who knows, he may come within reach of a palm himself. He reaches Rome, he is admitted into the prisons, and encourages to martyrdom such as had been shaken by the tears of those who were dear to them. Some of the jailers, converted by witnessing his faith and his miracles, became martyrs themselves, and one of the Roman magistrates asks to be instructed in a religion which can produce such men as this Sebastian. He has won the esteem of the emperors Diocletian and Maximian Hercules for his fidelity and courage as a soldier. They have loaded him with favors, and this gives him an influence in Rome, which he so zealously turns to the advantage of the Christian religion that the holy Pope Caius calls him the defender of the church. After sending innumerable martyrs to heaven, Sebastian at length wins the crown he had so ardently ambitioned. He incurs the displeasure of Diocletian by confessing himself a Christian. The heavenly king, for whose sake alone he had put on the helmet and soldier's cloak, was to him above all emperors and princes. He is handed over to the archers of Mauritania, who strip him, bind him, and wound him from head to foot with their arrows. They left him for dead, but a pious woman named Irene took care of him, and his wounds were healed. Sebastian again approaches the emperor, who orders him to be beaten to death in the circus near the imperial palace. Such are the soldiers of our newborn king, but oh, how richly does he repay them! Rome, the capital of his church, is founded on seven basilicas, as the ancient city was on its seven hills, and the name and tomb of Sebastian grace one of these seven sanctuaries. The Basilica of Sebastian stands in a sort of solitude on the Appian Way, outside the walls of the Eternal City. It is enriched with the relics of the holy pope and martyr Fabian, but Sebastian, the valiant leader of the Praetorian Guard, is the patron, 
and, as it were, the prince of the holy temple. It was here that he wished to be buried as a faithful guardian, near the well wherein the bodies of the holy apostles had been concealed, lest they should be desecrated by the persecutors. In return for the zeal of St. Sebastian for the souls of his Christian brethren, whom he had preserved from the contagion of paganism, God has made him the protector of the faithful against pestilence. A signal proof of this power granted to the holy martyr was given at Rome in the year 680 under the pontificate of St. Agatho. Let us now listen to our Holy Mother the Church, who thus speaks of her glorious martyr in the office of his feast. Sebastian, whose father was of Narbonne, and his mother, a lady of Milan, was beloved by a Diocletian on account of his noble birth and his virtues. Being a captain of the Praetorian cohort, he was able to give assistance and alms to the Christians, whose faith he himself followed, though privately. When he perceived any of them trembling at the great tortures of the persecutors, he made it his duty to encourage them. And so well did he do it that many would go, and for the sake of Jesus Christ would freely offer themselves to the executioners. Of this number were the two brothers, Mark and Marcellian, who were in custody under Nicostratus, whose wife named Zoe had recovered her speech by the prayer made for her by Sebastian. Diocletian, being told of these things, summoned Sebastian before him, and after upbraiding him in very strong words, tried every means to induce him to turn from the faith of Christ. But finding that neither promises nor threats availed, he ordered him to be tied to a stake and to be shot to death with arrows. Everyone thought he was dead, and a pious woman named Irene gave orders that his body should be taken away during the night and buried. But she, finding him to be still alive, had him taken to her house where she took care of him. Not long after, having quite recovered, he went before Diocletian and boldly chided him for his wickedness. At first the emperor was struck dumb with astonishment at the sight, for he had been told that Sebastian was dead. But at length the strange event and the martyr's sharp rebuke so inflamed him with rage that he ordered him to be scourged to death with rods. His body was thrown into a sewer, but Lucina was instructed by Sebastian in her sleep, both as to where his body was and where he wished to be buried. Accordingly, she buried him at the catacombs, where afterwards a celebrated church was built, called St. Sebastian's. Brave soldier of our Emmanuel, thou art now sweetly reposing at the foot of his throne. Thy wounds are closed, and thy rich palm branch delights all heaven by the freshness of its unfading beauty. Look down upon the church on earth, that tires not in singing thy praise. Each Christmas we find thee near the crib of the divine babe, its brave and faithful sentinel. The office thou didst once fill in an earthly prince's court is still thine, but it is in the palace of the king of kings. Into that palace we beseech thee, lead us by thy prayers, and gain a favorable hearing to our own unworthy petitions. With what a favorable ear must not our Lord Jesus receive all thy requests, who didst love him with such a brave love. Thirsting to shed thy blood in his service, thou didst scorn a battlefield where danger was not sure, and Rome, that Babylon which, as St. John says, was drunk with the blood of the martyrs. Rome alone was worthy of thee. And there it was not thy plan to cull a palm and hurry on to heaven. The courage of some of thy fellow Christians had wavered, and the thought of their danger troubled thee. Pushing into their prisons, where they lay mutilated by the tortures they had endured. Thou didst give to them back the fallen laurel, and teach them how to secure it in the grasp of holy defiance. It seemed as though thou wast commissioned to form a praetorian band for the king of heaven, and that thou couldst not enter heaven unless marshalling thither a troop of veterans for Jesus. Thy turn came at last, the hour of thy confession was at hand, and thou hadst to think of thine own fair crown. But for such a soldier as thou, Sebastian, one martyrdom is not enough. The archers have faithfully done their work, not an arrow is left in their quivers, and yet their victim lives, ready for a second sacrifice. Such were the Christians of the early times, and we are their children. 
Look then, O soldier of Christ, upon us, and pity us as thou didst thy brethren, who faltered in combat. Alas, we let everything frighten and discourage us, and oftentimes we are enemies of the cross, even while professing that we love it. We too easily forget that we cannot be companions of the martyrs unless our hearts have the generosity of the martyrs. We are cowardly in our contest with the world and its pomps, with the evil propensities of our nature and the tyranny of our senses, and thus we fall. And when we have made an easy peace with God and sealed it with the sacrament of his love, we behave as though we had now nothing more to do than to go on quietly to heaven without further trials or self-imposed sacrifices. Rouse us, great saint, from these illusions and waken us from our listless life. Our love of God is asleep, and all must needs go wrong. Preserve us from the contagion of bad example, and of those worldly maxims which gain currency even with Christian minds, because Christian lips call them rules of Christian prudence. Pray for us that we may be ardent in the pursuit of our sanctification, watchful over our inclinations, zealous for the salvation of others, lovers of the cross, detached from earthly things. O oh, by the arrows which pierced thee, we beseech thee, shield us from those hidden darts which Satan throws against us. Pray for us that we may be clad with the armor of God described to us by the great apostle. May we have on the breastplate of justice, which will defend us from sin, the helmet of salvation, that is the hope of gaining heaven, which will preserve us from both despair and presumption, the shield of faith, which will ward off the darts of the enemy, who seeks to corrupt the heart by leading the mind into error, and lastly the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, whereby we may put all false doctrines to flight and vanquish all our vices, for heaven and earth pass away, but the word of our God abides forever, and is given us as our rule and the pledge of our salvation. Defender is the church, as the vicar of Christ called thee. Lift up thy sword and defend her now. Prostrate her enemies and frustrate the plots they have laid for her destruction. Let her enjoy one of those rare periods of peace during which she prepares for fresh combats. Obtain for Christian soldiers engaged in just wars the blessing of the God of hosts. Protect the holy city of Rome, where thy tomb is honored. Avert from us, by thy intercession, the scourge of pestilence and contagion. Hear the prayers which, every year, are addressed to thee for the preservation of the creatures, given by God to man to aid him in his daily labor. Secure to us, by thy prayers, peace and happiness in this present life, and the good things of the life to come.